For countless centuries, peat land covered a large percentage of rural Ireland, and every farmer and indeed most people living in the country had a turf bank. During early spring, normally about the end of April, weather permitting, whole families would come to this lonely wilderness for the cutting of their crop of turf, which would hopefully provide them with a means of cooking food and keeping the house warm for the following year. Turf is a solid fossil fuel formed from ancient plants including trees, ferns and mosses which grew in swamps and bogs millions of years ago. Generation after generation of these plants died and were buried under layers of previous plants. Several thousand years ago there was a climate change. It became much wetter, natural hollows filled up with water, the vegetation did not decompose and the formation of peat bogs began. These turf would have about one third of the heating value of coal. Around the Balamoni area, lignite has been in the news lately. This is a brown black turf like coal. Well something between turf and coal and there is plenty of it there, enough to keep the power stations going for the next 40 years. This project is very unpopular with the people of that area and it is uncertain if it will ever become an industry there. This turf bank is in Gortnamoya, about five miles from Garva and on the road to Dungiven. The time taken to cut a year's supply of fuel would have depended on how much help a man had. Sometimes a husband and wife team working together could have been in the bog for a full week. If one of the older children was available for work, that time could have been cut to four days. Three experienced men like these, working hard, would easily have cut enough turf in three days to keep a house supplied for a full year. By the 1970s, people working in the moss was no longer the common sight that it used to be, for the ready supply of coal, electricity and oil heating had provided everyone living in even the most remote areas with an alternative to this backbreaking work. In 1992, the late Henry O'Kane from Glenullen was still cutting his turf in the Flough, a large piece of bog land between the Glen Road and Hillside Road on the outskirts of Garva, and which has remained undisturbed down the years. Henry would have spent most of the summer in the moss, cutting and working the turf by himself, and he told of a generation before this one when the Flough would have had many families working their turf there. In 1994, we filmed Willie Morell cutting turf at Ballyagan. These would not have been as good as the mountain turf, but years ago there were plenty of people in this moss too. The banks here had a lot of bog oak, or fir as we called it, and while great for kindling the fire in the morning, it was not very popular with the turf cutters. Before the turf cutting could begin, the bank had to be paired. This meant cutting about one foot of the top growth away, for this would not be suitable for burning. The pairings, or scraws as they were sometimes called, would usually have been thrown down to the bottom of the bank for a solid footing, but in earlier times they were an essential element when building a house. Years ago most dwellings were thatched houses, and the thatch was held down by pushing sally rods or scallops into the turf sods which was an essential element of the traditional roof. The turf scrawls served three purposes. One, they held down the thatch. Two, they kept out the cold and damp, for a thatched house was warm and snug in winter. And three, it was remarkably cool in the summer. I often heard older people say that the thatched house was the coolest place to be on a hot summer's day. By the early 1800s, most houses in the country were stone constructed with thatched roofs. There was no building control or no planning permission needed. If you owned a piece of land you simply built your house wherever you wished, often without foundations. Imagine the chaos today if that were still the case. The traditional turf cutting implement was known around these parts as a peat spade or a turf spade. The lug, sometimes called the wing or the sail, could have been on the left or the right, and the size of the spade would have determined the size of the peat cut. 
A wise turf cutter never cut them too big, for containing 80% moisture, they were difficult to get dried, even in a good year. Spades differed in various parts of the country. This one came from County Kerry and would have been foot assisted, and obviously cut much larger turf than the ones which we would have cut. This method of cutting is horizontal or breasting. We around these parts would have called this method stanking. It is where the turf spade is pushed into the bank and one turf is lifted out and placed either onto the ground or directly onto the turf barrow. Stanking was favoured when there were only two people, a cutter and a wheeler. The third man on this occasion is nicking the back so that the turf comes out clean. Stanking was the method used in most lowland bogs, not necessarily because it was handier, but because that was the way the grain of the turf was. The other way that the turf was cut was straight down, vertical or underfooting. This method would have been used in thin upland bogs and required three people, a cutter, a lifter and a wheeler. We in these parts call this way of cutting turf dabbing. Many writers and historians who were most likely never in the moss in their lives would say that dabbing was sore and heavy work. But I have found from talking to people who experienced it that in the moss dabbing, especially if you had a good lifter and wheeler, would have produced double the amount of turf cut in a day than the breasting method would have done. By the time the cutter had got down to the bottom of the bank, he had reached the best quality turf. These would dry out bone hard and black, almost like coal, and would burn for a good long time. The turf at the top of the bank were called reedies and would burn up very quickly. They were always used for lighting the fire. The other piece of equipment used by the turf cutting team was a peat barrow or turf barrow. Traditionally this was made entirely of wood, including the wheel. Although by the 1960s the wheel would have been a pumped up version with a tyre and tube, which made the wheeling a much easier task. Two or three rows of turf were piled onto the barrow and then the load was taken and emptied onto the spread field. Often to increase production a second barrow was being loaded with turf while the wheeler was tipping the first load, so when he came back there would be another load waiting for him. As time progressed, people were trying other, less back-breaking ways of getting their turf cut. Robert Kennedy and Bertie Faulkner gave a demonstration in the mid-1990s of how a one-horse powered slipe could carry many barrel loads of turf in one go out to the spread field. No doubt in other parts, small tractors were also used for this purpose. Robert, on his way back to the bank, had his slipe filled again for in those days even the youngest children accompanied their parents to the moss for the turf harvesting. These barrel loads of freshly cut turf would have to be left for a few days and this was a crucial time for torrential rain still common in May could ruin the whole crop. After a week of good dry weather they were spread out and by this time they had what was called a skin on them. After another three or four days they were turned over, although the bottom of the peat was also drying, for sitting high on the thick heather, the wind blew right through them. With the weather remaining dry, it was unlikely that this crop of turf would now be lost. After another four or five days, the turf were ready for footing. Four, six or sometimes eight turf were stood upright against each other, and when this task was completed, the battle of saving the peat harvest was almost over. The turf are now about half the size they were when they were cut, and although they still contain a good deal of moisture, they have hardening on all four sides, so only exceptionally bad weather would now harm them. In very bad years when turf were so wet that they couldn't be footed, they might have been castled. This was leaving two on the ground, two more across, two more across on top of that, and one more across the top. In very wet years, people would have gone to any measure to try and save their turf. I've heard of people tying strings onto sticks 
making something like a clothesline and placing the wet turf up against the string to keep them off the wet ground. It was not uncommon many a year to take home a load of wet turf and hope that they would dry out in the shed. Such was the importance of this fuel crop, almost as needful as food. Of course, if the turf couldn't be saved because of the wet weather, then it was also likely that the crops of oats and potatoes couldn't be planted either. So it was not unusual for special prayers to be included in church or chapel services for good weather during April and May, and indeed later on again at haymaking time. Our turf got off to a good start. For two weeks after the cutting, the weather remained warm and dry. Another couple of weeks like this, and they would be ready for home. However, towards the end of May, the rain never far away in this country was back, and this halted the drying process. The turf would now have to be turn-footed. This meant turning the footing upside down and inside out as well. If the weather didn't improve then, this process could have been repeated two or three times. Saving the crop of turf, just like the hay or the oats, depended greatly on the weather. By the middle of June, the turf had finally dried and could have been drawn home from the footings. They could also have been piled into larger clumps, which we called rickles. This allowed the wind to blow through them and dry out completely. By the end of July or August at the latest, the turf would have been taken home. Progress made in farming technology during the 20th century was accelerated during the 1950s and 60s as more sophisticated machines came onto the market. The farming industry, which had moved at the speed of the horse for the last hundred years, was now rapidly moving into the 20th century, and all sorts of new gadgets powered by the tractor were becoming available to speed up the farming process and slowly but surely do away with manpower on the farms. This old cine film, taken during the late 1960s, is of the late Bobby Gilmer of Killy Valley. Big farms which, before the Second World War, were employing up to six men, and often two or three women or girls, were now gradually becoming a one-man and one-woman operation. At that time, too, Many bog lands were being drained, ploughed up and made into fields. Huge grants were available for at that time farmers were still guaranteed a market for all the food they could produce. Potatoes grown in mossy ground were particularly good to eat. This march of progress inevitably affected the turf cutting, for around that time someone invented a turf cutting machine, capable of cutting more turf in an hour than a man with a spade could have done in a week. This ingenious machine dug the peat from the ground and deposited it in four neat rows. All that was needed now was plenty of sun to dry the turf. These would dry very hard. This particular machine is the property of John Linton from near the town of Kilray, 
but before any cutting can begin, the tractor has to be fitted with double wheels. This is to give a good grip in the moss and to prevent sinking if the weather is bad. Cutting with a machine always started a lot later than the man with the spade, for it was May or June before the ground was hard enough to allow this heavy tractor to operate. However, the machine-cut turf always dried a lot quicker than the spade-cut ones. Double wheels have to be fitted to the front as well. The tractor is a 1980 SIM, 82 horsepower and made in Italy. John bought it in 1984 for £6,500. It is air-cooled and never gave any trouble. The cutting machine itself is a Taka Turf Master and was made in 1975 by Tom Maguire Engineering of Mahara. The last time it was used was in 1990, so 15 years later John's son Philip is hopeful that it will still work. The gearbox from a Bedford lorry must be kept filled with oil and is fitted to the power shaft of the tractor. It drives this ogre which lifts the peat from the moss and forces it through the pipe and into four smaller pipes which leave the finished product on the ground. John first got this machine 30 years ago and for the following 15 years was busy cutting plots of turf for people around Kilray and as far away as the Gary Bog near Balamoney where he remembers in 1984 cutting 134 plots and working both day and night. The moss where Philip is working now is called Tala Banks, just outside the village of Tamlet Acrilly. These turf are a brown colour, as most lowland turf are, but they will dry out black and will burn well. The opening made by the machine as it digs the turf up will be covered over by the big double wheels of the tractor. This plot of turf will produce about 150 bags and, weather permitting, will be ready for home in three weeks' time. Joe Nelson, his wife Marion, son, daughter and four grandchildren live in the townland of Killymuck on the road between Kilray and Mahara. Joe's house is one of few remaining houses which today still totally depends on machine-cut turf, not only to heat the house but also provide hot water and do the cooking as well. This stove, a Rayburn Royal, was installed here in 1958 at a cost of £65 and could burn up to 500 bags of turf in a year. Other popular names of solid fuel cookers at that time were Stanley and Modern Mistress and they could have burned turf, sticks or coal. Joe's extended family come home here for Christmas dinner every year and the turkey is always cooked in this oven. One drawback that this cooker has is that it needs constant refuelling, for the firebox which held about eight turf would have needed a fresh supply of fuel every half hour. 500 bags of turf burned in a year would also have produced a good lot of ashes which had to be disposed of sometimes twice or three times daily. This house was renovated in 1978 and a wraparound boiler was fitted to the cooker, so at the present time it is heating nine radiators. With heating oil having increased by almost 30% in the past year, Joe Nelson intends to keep his shed well filled with turf. The working career of the mechanical turf cutter was a short one, for like the flax pulling machine 20 or 30 years earlier, it arrived on the scene right at the end of the turf cutting era. If the burning of turf had remained popular for heating and cooking, who knows what kind of machines might have evolved. Indeed it is likely that these days drying devices would have been built into the cutting machine and it would not be an impossible dream to think that you could have been cutting your turf in the morning and drawing them home in the evening. Sadly, however, those days are gone forever and the turf cutting machines, like the turf spades and barrows, are now lying rusting in the back of some farmer's shed, unlikely ever to be brought out again. Men who had spent most of their youthful summers in the moss now tell the young people 
about a happy, contented time long ago of back-breaking work, the battles against the elements, and of being half-eaten alive by midges. 170 years ago, in 1835, there was a survey carried out in the Mid-Ulster and Northwest regions of the province which told that the occupation of the people was mostly farming, with many of the poor cotters being described as flax weavers. Their humble dwellings were described as narrow and dark. In them, smoke and other nuisances seemed to prevail within their walls, and dung pits and pools of stagnant water lay close to the doors and windows. The main food of the poor was potatoes and meal. Salt herrings were much used, and in Kilray, on the river Ban, trout, salmon and eels were a good part of the local diet. The better off farmers and the landlords kept cattle, pigs, sheep and poultry. These cattle were black and most farmers would have had eight or nine of them. They were good for beef or milking. Nowadays when the housewife wants to buy meat she will most likely go to the butchers and this scene is a delivery of beef to McAtamney's butchers in Garva. This beef comes in a refrigerated lorry from Oma Meats in County Tyrone. These carcasses of meat weigh between 170 and 180 pounds and they will provide sirloin, chump and fillet steak, topside beef, shin for soup, stewing steak, silver side roast and eye steak roast. McAtamneys make their own mince from the trimmings of the steak. They have been in the butchery business for 70 years and despite recent health scares about red meat, they will go through a delivery this size every week. An old butchery premises was being demolished recently to make way for a new supermarket, and in the yard was a strange-looking stone. One of the older residents of the town told us that he remembered this stone and what it was used for. The cobbled yard might give a clue. Long ago there was no refrigerated van to bring the meat to the butchers. The butcher went out to the farm, selected a bullock from about four or five years old, and bought it from the farmer. He then walked it back to the butcher's yard. Nowadays beef cattle must be killed no older than 30 months. The stone had a large metal ring in it. You can still see the indentation where the ring was. The unfortunate animal's head was pulled down onto the stone and it was slaughtered. The O'Connell brothers were butchers here and it was said that their meat was very good because they did not kill the animal straight away. When it had walked maybe two or three miles in from the farm, its muscles were all tensed up which would have made the meat grisly. But after a couple of days it had settled down and that is why the meat was so good. Local man Henry Borland is turning the old grindstone which the butchers used to sharpen their knives. The blood would have flowed through this grating, most likely into the Agivey River. In the year 1835, things were much different, for that was ten years before the Great Famine, and there were almost twice as many people in Ireland then as now. Many poor people were living on the poverty line, Fathers had been dividing their land up with their sons for several generations and by this time small farms would have been only five or six acres, unfit to keep large cattle. A small breed of cattle which was popular then was Black Dexters. Hard and Deirdre Hilton farm at Bavidi between Garva and Kilray and they keep a herd of these small cattle which were said to have come to Ireland with the Spanish Armada over 400 years ago. It is believed that the Dexter originally came over with the Spanish during the Armada. These animals were bred down to uh, uh, provide milk and meat on the galleons and when they went aground off the southwest tip of Ireland, County Kerry, they swam ashore and lived as feral cattle in County Kerry. Uh, if you look at a, a Dexter bull with horns he does look very much like a Spanish fighting bull, only a lot smaller. A hundred years ago, the smallholders would have all had a little Dexter, or the majority anyway, and it fed the house with milk and beef. They reared the bull calves for beef, 
and many of the older generation will tell you that their family had a little Dexter in the old days or that they used to milk them. Unfortunately they are a little bit short in the legs or some of them for milking but they managed in the old days and, and they were the lifeblood of a lot of the little small holdings. Pheasant Hill farm shop in Cumber sell all our Dexter beef. We source, the Dexter uh, group over in, in Northern Ireland, which I'm the chairperson of, sources the meat, the Dexter beef, for that shop. And it's in great demand. They can't get enough of it. It is the favourite meat of the rare breeds. They also can't get enough over in England. Uh, is it expensive? It's to us. We wouldn't get any more for the, for the animal, really, than you would for a commercial animal. But certainly they can put a premium on it at selling it in the shop. And over in England they'll get a premium for it. We're just getting up and off the ground here, as yet we haven't got enough bullocks to supply the demand. But we hope when that happens that definitely the price will go up. So you have no problem getting rid of all you can produce? No, no problem whatsoever. Another rare breed of cattle is the Irish Moiled. This is a small hornless breed, red in colour and usually marked by a white line down the back. The Irish Moiled is a very friendly little cow, a very reliable milker or suckler and can live up to 20 years of age. Margaret and Armour Kennedy live close to the village of Cullybacke and have a herd of 17 cattle. This breed was very popular in Ireland during the 1800s, but by the end of that century the shorthorn, around about the same size, had taken over and by the 1960s the Irish Moiled was almost extinct, with only two small herds left in all of Ireland. The breed managed to survive and in the 1980s a Rare Breeds Trust was set up to preserve breeds like the Moiled and the Dexters. The breed still remains on the critical list of rare breeds, although at the present time there are about 226 breeding cows in Ireland and throughout Great Britain. Another branch of farming long ago and seldom seen today is beekeeping. Scientists tell us that bees have been around for 40 million years. They first appeared in tropical Africa, subsequently were taken to America with the first colonists and were then distributed worldwide. They have developed a non-selfish social behaviour pattern, similar to ants, where each one works for the good of the hive. These bees should not be confused with the big bumblebees which we often see around the garden. They are about the size of a wasp. We were able to get a good picture of this one because she was drying out after flying into a pond. A typical hive like this would contain about 20,000 bees and they are divided into three types, the queen, drones and workers. The queen is much larger than the others and her main function in life is to lay eggs, which she does at an alarming rate of 200,000 a year. She never leaves the hive and is fed, kept warm or cool depending on the weather and will live for about two years. Workers, as their name would suggest, do most of the work around the hive. Most of their work consists of flying in and out of the hive, collecting nectar and pollen, which is made into honey. They can fly as far as three miles from the hive and will also visit trees to collect resin, which is used as a glue to seal up any cracks in the hive. The workers' lifespan is a short one, as little as 20 days in the summer, for they simply work themselves to death. They will live for about 140 days during the winter. The other bees in the hive are called drones. There are about 200 of them and their only purpose is to mate with the queen. They can neither gather pollen nor nectar, have no sting and when winter comes they are thrown out of the hive by the workers to starve to death. If the queen stops producing eggs, the workers will simply produce a new one in a specially prepared queen cell. Willie Thompson keeps five hives of bees and during the 2005 season he was in the process of moving house so this one was left at Garva. 
These bees have a sting as painful as a wasp, although the pain will not last so long, but they will not sting unless provoked, unlike the wasp. Also unlike the wasp, after stinging, the bee will die quickly. A specially designed bee suit is worn for protection, although Woolley does not wear any protection on his hands. He doesn't seem to worry about the stinging. It is said that old beekeepers never took arthritis because of the chemical in the stings. The dog learned very quickly that it was best to give them a wide berth. When the good weather comes, the bees are very busy. They collect the pollen on their back legs. You can see some of them going into the hive with their legs white. At this time of the year, up to a dozen workers will be busy keeping the queen cool by flapping their wings like a fan. A major irritation for the beekeeper is when the bees swarm. This means that some of the bees leave the hive and usually attach themselves to the nearest tree. Bees will swarm only if there is some kind of problem in the hive, like overcrowding or discontentment with the performance of the old queen, and will only swarm on very hot days. This swarm is only a few feet away from the hive and represents about half of the hive. These bees have produced another queen and have gorged themselves with honey, enough to keep them alive for four days. It is likely that half the honey in the hive has gone. The remainder of the bees in the hive are working away, and Willie Thompson now faces the task of finding a new home for the swarm. Sometimes if the swarm are in a single branch it can be cut off, with the bees still attached, but these are on the V of the tree. Willie shakes the tree violently and manages to shake half of them, about 5,000 bees, into a cardboard box and covers it with a towel. He then gets the bottom part of another hive, called a skip, and tips out of the box and can now hope that the bees will accept this new home. The other half of the swarm is still attached to the tree. Some beekeepers would use a hand brush and sweep them in, but Willie reckons that if they accept their new home, they will go in by themselves. If they don't, no amount of persuading will tempt them in. A few bees are going in and out, sizing up the situation, and suddenly the whole swarm starts to move. They have accepted the new hive, and Willie has got another hive of bees. If you look at the top right-hand side of the picture, you will see a couple of bees with their bottoms up in the air. Willie thinks that they are sending out some form of signal to the others in the tree, who already are flying around in an excited state. These are indeed complex creatures, and man has still a lot to learn about them. Willie checks the other hive, and just as he thought, much of his honey has gone. By the middle of August, Willie decides to remove the harvest of honey from the hive. A hive this size would usually produce about 30 pounds. The honeycombs are replaced with empty ones, and whatever honey the bees produce for the rest of the year will keep them fed over the winter. Some beekeepers would take all of the honey and feed the bees on sugar and water, but Willie thinks that they are better fed the natural way on their own honey. Bees are not aggressive like wasps and will only sting when provoked. This, however, was one of those times, for after this they went into an angry mood and the cameraman and everyone else in the garden within a radius of 30 yards received many stings. Rubbing vinegar on the affected part eases the pain. The next step in the process is to extract the honey from the combs. The bees have sealed in the honey with wax and Willie is now in the process of removing the wax or breaking the seal so that the bees' honey can come out. Some people would keep this wax for cleaning furniture. The section containing about three pounds is then placed into an extractor to separate the honey from the wax. The extractor works like a washing machine, throwing the honey out to the sides where it will drop down. This process takes about ten minutes. The empty section will be returned to the hive and the bees will eat any remaining honey that is left.
The honey and the wax are strained through a flour sieve, and the honey is now ready for use. For many of the farmers' wives, things have changed greatly in the last half century. Nowadays, the farmer's wife would often be a teacher, nurse or civil servant, rather than doing the chores around the farm. In the old days, a farmyard would have been a very busy place, with hens, ducks, geese and other poultry running around freely. In the 1930s, there were no battery cages. Hens laid their eggs where they liked, and it was up to the farmer's wife to search for them, sometimes in a hedge, for the hen didn't always lay in the nest provided for her. The money made from the sale of eggs always went to the farmer's wife. Well-known Garva businessman T.B.F. Thompson started out by buying eggs from farms around the country. A breed of poultry which was becoming popular at that time was the Morans. Morans is a town in western France and that is where these birds originated. They are well suited to our climate and are best known for their dark chocolate coloured eggs. There are several different breeds of Morans but the best known are the Cuckoo Morans. This cockbird would weigh about nine pounds, could be quite aggressive and would make a very good bird for the table. Fighting birds would usually be associated with cocks, but these two young hens recently introduced to each other are having a fight simply to determine who is boss. This practice is common in all birds, wild or domestic. It is to establish what is known as the pecking order. This would have been a typical farmyard breed during World War II. They would start laying at about five months and could lay for four or five years. Louise McLean is a member of the Morans Club, lives near Port Rush, and introduces us to another member of this family. Here we have our French copper black Morans. This is a rooster. He's two year old. Um, he would differ from the cuckoo Morans in that um, his feathering obviously is dark with the gold coloured heckles. Um, another characteristic that the copper black would have, they would have feathered legs. Um, the cuckoo variety wouldn't have feathered legs. They have slate coloured legs as opposed to the cuckoo having white legs. His comb would have uh, between five and seven serrations on the comb. So he, he typically would be a very good example of the French copper black Morans. Um, these birds, like the cuckoo, would originate from the townland in Morans in France and these would have been introduced to Britain in about 1929. Um, the French copper black Moran, their egg would be that bit darker than the cuckoo and it would be almost like a dark chocolate brown. We have a few eggs there that we can look at later on. Robert Booth from Garva also keeps Morans, and these chicks are six weeks old. These are the Cuckoo Morans, and already they are showing the speckled colour which makes them stand out from the other hens. This picture is of Robert's daughter, Victoria, already showing a keen interest in poultry, and they also keep racing pigeons. At the same time, Robert had some chicks hatching. These birds were hatched out in an incubator. Louise never uses that method. She says that she gets much better results clocking the eggs under silky hens, sometimes as high a rate as 10 out of 10. Another local breeder is Paul Kirk, seen here with his son Jimmy. This rooster and hens are 14 months old and are laying well at the present time. Jimmy demonstrates the difference in colour between a Moran's egg and one bought in the supermarket. Duck and poultry sales used to be common here. It was said that by the turn of the last century there were over 4 million ducks and 2 million geese in Ireland. In recent times in the townland of Killygullum, John Linton, yes the same John Linton as owns the turf cutting machine, 
and his neighbour Maureen Pollock started a duck and poultry sale and farmers market once every month. We asked John when this venture first got off the ground. Uh, May 204. And it, was, it started off successfully and it's been very successful ever since. Very, very successful. We're running the biggest poultry sale in Ireland. And how many people do you have coming here? You know, you, you, you hold it every month? Usually there's a crowd on the road, six, seven hundred people every month. Yeah. It's the second Saturday in every month. And you have all different kinds of poultry and uh, ducks as well? Oh, aye. All different kinds of fowl. So what, what's your plans for the future now? Well, we'll just keep this running as long as we can and hope it will get bigger and better. It's certainly not getting any smaller, is anyway. it? No, it's not. It's getting bigger every time we seem to do it. And Maureen, I see you're selling a lot of uh, potatoes, tomatoes, turnips. Whatever the people want, we sell. So, and these produce are all fresh? They are, every one of them is fresh, yes. Yeah. And so you, you, have a, you have a good sale. I see your tomatoes there, are those home grown? They are, yes, uh huh. And the potatoes will be organic, I suppose? Aye, they are. Aye, they must be organic produce there, surely. All right, folks, we'll just have to see you're doing a great job and good luck in the future. Kennedy from Ballymoney was at the sale that day and he had a peculiar breed of bird at the market. It's black, red, modern and game. A modern game? Yes. We use them for showing purposes. And you're telling me that that boy's father won Balmoral? Won Supreme Champion at Balmoral mm -hmm. and won Ballymoney as well. So really they'd only be for showing those birds? Only for showing a good pet, they're easy kept, you know, there's no real work. Uh, and they're very quiet as well, see. Break. Uh, them just run about the yard at home. Right. But the cocks, whenever they get bigger, they'll fight with her. They yeah. wouldn't, you have to keep them sort of right. separate. Have you know. separated them? So there's that game thing on them? There's that game on them, man. Uh -huh. They'd be related to the pet game, you know, or a smaller uh -huh. version of it. I see they were set of spurs on them there, so they, they could probably inflict a bit of damage, you know. They could. I know that's a young boy yet, they're about to grow on it. Yeah. What age is that bird? That boy only about six months. He's an early bird this early this year. Right. Know. And what age would they live to? Life span of them would be about four years. Four years. And you're, you're telling me they'll lay a wee egg? Small egg. You would need about two in the pan to make it worthwhile. Uh, maybe three. Maybe three, <laughs> But Jimmy, if you were selling those boys, you obviously have them for here for sale. What, what would you be asking for? They're normally £20 a pair. £20 for Doing a pair? Doing them a day for a ten or a pair. Mm -hmm. Doing them a day for a ten. Too many were overstocked. You're sort of like myself, you're doing buy one, get one free. How's that? <laughs> like their school. Thanks for talking to me, Jimmy. OK, thanks, sir. Once again, we would like to thank you for watching this video or DVD and say a special thanks to all those who helped during the making of it. As the video title suggests, those days of old really are gone, and probably forever. For when we suggested to John Linton that with the current high price of oil, the turf-cutting machine might soon be back in business, he replied, Never. For people wouldn't have the time now to work with turf. Look at the modern farmer, always in a hurry and working half the night. There is no doubt that technology has brought us a long way in the past hundred years, though some people may not appreciate the changes. Perhaps the old days were the best. <laughs>